this time on the Highland Woodworker. I ended up inheriting a genetic eye disease. By the time I was you know, 20 years old, 99% of my vision had gone. When we heard Master Woodworker George Wurzel's story, we just had to meet him. He'll share with us how he uses his mind's eye and other senses every time he enters his East Tennessee workshop to create something new. After that first cut, I move maybe a sixteenth of an inch at a time towards the end of the mortise. Plus, Jeff Miller's step-by-step -step guide to chopping a mortise in popular woodworking magazines, tips, tricks, and techniques. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. At a young age, a degenerative eye disease left master woodworker George Wurzel in the dark. But that hasn't stopped him from creating wonderful pieces like these. How does he do it? Let's go to his East Tennessee workshop where he shows us how in our moment with a master. George Wurzel, so nice to see you, my friend. Uh, I've been looking forward to this because uh, yours is gonna, I think, pan out to be a very interesting, unique story. Tell us about who is George Wurzel? Well, I started off um, in my mother's womb way back in Saginaw, Michigan, about 65 years ago. It turns out that I should have done a better job picking, you know, parents with better genes. I ended up inheriting a genetic eye disease, which is called retinitis pigmentosis. And that eye disease is such that it affects most people much later in life. It's, uh, most, most people are familiar with it as, you know, some sort of retinal degeneration diseases and that that appear you know, when people get into their 50s and 60s and those kind of things. I was, I was one of the really lucky people in mine appeared the day I was born. And I had a little tiny vision when I was a kid, but by the time I was you know, 20 years old, 99% of my vision had gone. So I've, I've spent my whole life so far, uh, adult life so far, as a blind person. You knew that your vision was degenerating. And so you got a special education for uh, a person that was facing that, that well, crisis? Well, I was fortunate enough back in the, in the day during the, what I consider the, the heyday of um, uh, residential schools for the blind. I happened to go to a residential school for the blind in Michigan, Michigan School for the Blind. And it was, it, you know, you can always look and research things in hindsight. And when you go back and look at it, you can see that it truly was at the, the top of its game. I mean, it, it had multiple trade programs that are taught at the School for the Blind. You could learn how to be a piano tuner. You could learn how to do business management programs. You could learn how to be a Volkswagen mechanic, which is what I learned how to do. You could learn to be a small engines mechanic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took every single machine shop class, woodworking class. But uh, I started off in high school and everything, working at a Volkswagen dealership, uh, fixing, uh, rebuilding engines. Uh, worked at a regular Volkswagen dealership as a, working in the engine room, rebuilding engines. Flat rate on a Volkswagen engine at that point in time was 13 hours. I could always get one done in 10, and if I was really in a hurry, I could get one done in eight, and wow. which meant you get paid the extra three hours for not even doing it. I liked that. <laughs> and, uh, and then I decided one day, I just didn't like getting dirty and grimy and greasy and thicky, and, um, and I quit. Uh, George is kind of pig-headed. He does that now and then. Um, and a friend of mine was in the um, boat, wooden boat building business, uh, Chip Stulen, so I started hanging out with him doing a few things. And then my brother and I, another friend of mine, we were goofing around and, and uh, I had stumbled across a nice design for a nice piece of folding uh, lawn furniture and started making some and putting them out in the front yard for sale. And a guy um, came by and bought two chairs and a couple weeks later, he came back and bought 100, and I was in the woodworking business. George is not only known for his woodworking, but he became a big star after appearing in a popular Subaru commercial. 
If you would have told me before I did that ad that a person could do a single ad on TV and go anywhere in the country and walk through an airport or a restaurant or a hotel and people would come up to you and say, are you the guy in the Subaru ad? I'd have told you you're crazy. George, how do you tell unsighted that this is beautifully spalted or what this wood has to offer? Let me trade pieces with you there. Okay. For a you hold on to that one. So yeah. with this block of wood, I found this in someone's firewood pile, a piece of birch. And spalted wood, when you were fortunate enough or lucky enough to find a piece, if you like if the piece has been cross cut off, if you look at the, the end grain especially, you will find little fuzzy lines that mimic the lines that you see here where they come out to the edge, where the bacteria and everything is. So if you pick up a piece and you're and you, you dust it off like this, you'll find that you can feel those little tiny lines. And then when you start to turn this on the lathe, when you start getting down into it, if you turn it, if you have a really nice sharp tool and you turn a pretty smooth texture on it, maybe hit it with a scraper one time and then hit it with a mister bottle, then you can actually feel that the, your finger will go real smooth stop, real smooth stop, real smooth stop. And every time your finger stops, those, those spalted lines are sticky when you hit it with water. So it gives me a really good indication of, you know, how much spalting and what there is there. And well, that's valuable whether you're sighted or right. unsighted. Yeah. Is so to be able those to are just little things that you learn, you know, uh, as you go along as a blind person, how to, how to do that. I mean, I, I, I missed, I, I mix up um, water with about 25% alcohol in it, denatured alcohol, and I spray stuff all the time when I want to know what the grain pattern is. Um, I don't, I, if you're going to build pretty stuff, in my opinion, there's no reason to start off with ugly wood. You should, if you're going to spend the time and energy and work at it, you should, um, you should build, um, build stuff that looks pretty. Well, that's now, great. Now, I also spend a huge amount of time, let's pull this one out here. This, this is part luck and part, part skill, both. This particular piece of wood where this knot was cut and where the saw happened to cut it, happened to cut it at exactly the perfect spot because you have two grain patterns overlaying each other right here. You see the grain pattern that was the tree underneath and then you see the grain pattern that was caused by the limb growing off. And I sanded this with, a, with sandpaper with, on a sponge, so real fine paper on a really soft sponge. And then when you use the end of your fingers on it and you follow the grains, you'll pull the soft grains out and leave the hard grains. And when you're done, you end up with something when you run your hand across that that's just incredibly uh, sensual to the touch. I mean, there's no other way to you know, talk about it. So now you've got texture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And, and, and you contrast that to with a perfectly smooth pine on the sides, you know. So mm -hmm. sanded this with a block, you know, with a hard back on it. So this is, even though there's a knot here, this is all perfectly smooth and flat here. And then you can just feel the, just feel the, the uh, joints on the corners just a little bit. And those will always pop a little bit just because of expansion and contraction from humidity. George, one of the many questions that uh, I would have as a woodworker for one who is, uh, is blind is, how do you measure? And measuring, as you know, is the most important part of making things come out right. If you don't need two pieces that are the same size, it becomes irrelevant. If you need 100 pieces all exactly the same size, it becomes very relevant. Um, in, the, in the tables that I build, um, the the distance between these dados uh, is very important, and then the, the depth and the, and the width of the dados are you know, extremely important because these are half laps, so you have to get exactly in the right depth and everything. Yeah. So if you want to know the depth of this dado, you use this fancy tool that I have in my hand that's called a click rule. A click rule. Click rule, yep. And you put the end of this, extend it out, and you put the end of this down in the bottom and then you push it down until you come against the, the, the stop block here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this has a little spring loaded detent ball bearing right here. And these little threads that you see is a piece of threaded rod, 16 threads to the inch. So we, and then right here at the end of my finger, you can see there's another little bar that goes across. So those are at half inch increments. So I know from here, 
to that little bar is a half inch. So now the only thing I have to figure out is how much beyond a half inch it is. So there's one sixteenth that I clicked in. There's two sixteenths that I clicked in. And I know that if I can get my fingernail back behind that bar, that's, that is truly the half inch spot rather than it being you know, flush with the end. And that was done because if, if you put it up there and that's the half, you can't tell if it's in one or two because you can't feel it anymore. If you mm -hmm. can still get your fingernail through the, in there, just like you know that you're in the right spot. So we had half inch, and then you get one sixteenth, two sixteenths, okay? So if you put that back down here and you put it on our piece like this, you can see that you get exactly five eighths of an inch in depth is what that is yeah. using this ruler. And the, the important thing is, you know, when you do things is, is how do you, you know, how do you measure and measure really accurately? Okay, so if we want to measure from this to the end of the piece, if we took and set our piece down here against the, the fence, set it down here against the fence, put my trusty little ruler on here and push them both up because this has a taper, this has a bevel on the end of it, so it's a little bit hard to tell if you're exactly. I eliminated that problem. I put the end of the piece against the fence of the saw, and then I put it up there. Mm -hmm. So now I have half inch, one inch. So how far am I past the one inch mount? One, two, three, four. So an inch and a quarter distance is where this dado starts from the end of our piece. So if we wanted to set our table saw, we go back to our one, two, three, four. There's our inch and a quarter again. It has a little lock nut on it so it won't move. So we want to, if this was a dado set, which isn't it's just a single blade, but if we want to now set the fence up to our, to our ruler here, you just keep bringing it in. Okay, it just barely touched it. So you set your little piece there, flush up your fingers. Okay. And then if I had a, a ruler here for people who are retinal dependent, you could, <laughs> you could check it. But I can also then take this piece up here and check that and put that. And as you can see, that just fits in there perfectly. Yeah. Between there and there. So. Mm -hmm. I can set, if that was a dado set, and that dado set happened to be an inch and a quarter wide, which won't fit on this saw, it fits on my other saw. And then you could put these up here, put them against your pretty little, pretty little cross-cut guide and chuck them across, do that in, and do this in. Then you have to reset from the end to whatever this one is. So you would just repeat the process. You'd stake and put your piece down here, put it against the end, come over there, Get your measurement, come back over here, take your saw, fence, move it over, and at the same time that you can say Jackie Robinson, and then you take check it with your piece here. Now oh, we were we're a 30 second off. Okay, and then here again, you'd be ready to go to do your next dados. Yeah. So, so the name of this again it's is called a click rule, and yep. they're available. And you, through National Federation for the Blind and Baltimore, Maryland, they sell them at their Aids and Appliances store. There, um, people think they're a little pricey. They're um, hundred bucks, and you get the ruler, but you also get this. Okay, from here to here, with this fully extended, is six inches from the face of this block to the face of this block is six inches, so I can measure anything from zero to a foot with this, depending which one I measure to. So if I want, so if you want one inch from here to there is one inch, if you really wanted seven inches from here to here is seven inches. So you do have to be a little bit smarter than the average tape measure guy, but not much, just a little bit. You just have to be able to add six, and six isn't too hard for most people. Most people can get six. Well, George, at some point in your uh, training as a woodworker, your life as a woodworker, you've run into somebody, I'm sure, that said you're going to cut your fingers off. How did that take place? And tell me that well, story. One of, the, one of the one's stories of that nature that comes into my mind the best is when I went to Catawba Valley College over in Hickory, North Carolina to be in their furniture production management program. Um, I applied to go to school there 
And at the time that I applied, I was pretty poor, so I couldn't afford to travel from northern Michigan down to look at their school and, and then travel back and then travel back down if I decided I was going to go there. So I had done all my correspondence with them via the, by then, back then it was the wonderful U.S. mail. And I'd sent them Xerox of my portfolio and those kinds of things to look at so they could see the kind of work that I'd been doing. Did and they then, know you were uh, blind? So they had no idea whatsoever that I was blind bef until the day that I showed up to go to school. And so I walk into the guidance counselor's office and I sit down in the chair to talk to him about the program and where I fit in and what my expectations were and all that. And we, we hadn't been in his office for more than a minute and a half, just passed, hello, goodbye, I mean, hello, how are you, what's your name, whatever. And he goes, I think we have a problem. And I says, I don't have a problem. Do you have a problem? He goes, are how much can you see? And I said, oh, that's not a problem. I don't see anything. And he goes, that's a problem. He says, we, we teach people here how to run big pieces of industrial woodworking equipment. And I think it's very dangerous. I said, it's dangerous for a person who's like you, who's blind, you know, to be doing those things. And I said to him, I said, sir, I said, when I shook your hand, I happened to notice that you only had the thumb and one finger on well, your hand. I says, can you tell me how you lost your finger? And he goes, well, yeah, and it was a woodworking accident. And I said to him, I asked him, are you blind? And he goes, no. And I says, so obviously cutting one's fingers off has nothing to do with being blind. And <laughs> dead silence on his side of the desk. And, and that was pretty much the end of our conversation as it related to, to the blindness issue. He was probably just as apprehensive when I walked in as when I walked out, but we had, we had moved the conversation on to his wait and see, you know, and see what happened. Well, George, what uh, would you like to be known for? What's your legacy? I have no desire to have my name, you know, written in lights on the, you know, on the front of a building somewhere. That doesn't excite me at all. But when I see people's personal pleasure in, you know, things that I've made and that they have, that, that really makes me happy. Later in the show, we'll head back to George's workshop, where he'll fire up his lathe and spin up a wonderful woodworking lesson. But first, making a mortise by hand, Jeff Miller shows us how. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Masterpiece Oil and Wax and Wayne Mobley. It's beautiful, Wayne. What do you think? Love it. Excellent product. Would recommend it to my friends. There you go. And this is the wax that you're putting on this over the, the oil wax, right yes. now. Uh -huh. Wow. Good shine. The natural look just is gorgeous. And it makes him smile. Masterpiece Wood Finish because it's your masterpiece. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker II is the all-purpose combination blade, but for special cuts, Woodworker IIs are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect far as woodworker two for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase 
or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. Now, when I chop a mortise, I actually start with some pairing. And I'm going to pair away the very top layer to my scribed lines. And I push forward. The bevel of the chisel is facing up. And I've got pressure on the top of the chisel, which means it's not going to slip beyond where I'm going. And at the end, I can sort of flip that out and I get a very controlled cut, and it's down to the depth of the scribed lines. And that leaves those lines, those sharp edges there, intact. This makes it easier for me to take my mortise chisel and fit it right into this shallow recess. And so it doesn't have to be quite so visual. I can get a tactile feedback on where the chisel is. And now I can start to chop. So I'm going to use a chisel here. It's basically the same size. It's a little bit smaller than what I scribed out here because I'll finish up afterwards by paring the side walls. Now I start in the middle here and I'm working with the flat side of the chisel. This middle cut doesn't matter, but I will eventually work with the flat side of the chisel going towards the ends of the cut. And right here I can see, I'm in a position where I can see vertical very well. If necessary, you can set yourself up with a square here next to your work as a guide. But I think you'll find that after a little bit that you're just fine with that. After that first cut, I move maybe a sixteenth of an inch at a time towards the end of the mortise. And I'll chop down and then I will lever out the waist. I come towards the bevel and then away from the bevel, and that pops out that chip right there. And then I can continue. I can set that up there, chop down, and lever out the waist. You want to keep the chisel as square as possible, both this way and then in terms of the rotation. And you want to make this back and forth as square as possible also. You don't want, you don't want to be levering off to, to one side or the other. That'll damage the side walls of your mortise. Now you can get pretty deep in one pass. Yes, this is walnut, which is fairly soft. But I'm already at least a half an inch in here on my mortises. And I am not going to go all the way to the end, to my scribed end, just yet. Because I'm levering against that point, that doesn't make any sense at this stage. Now I'm going to turn the chisel around and work back towards me from the center again. Same thing. So the flat side of the chisel always go, goes towards the outside of the cut. 
working from the center in both directions. Coming up, great wood turning lessons with George Wurzel. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside Router Bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Upgrade your shop today. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading band saws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Well, George, what are you going to turn? Looks like you've got uh, some segments there glued together. I've got a little segmented block here that I threw up here on the lathe, and it's a, I make a lot of little wine bottle stoppers and and bottle openers and fin heels and those kind of things and uh, this nice little piece here as you can see i'm starting off with a nice little tool to work on that great big piece of wood <laughs> and uh, this is uh got probably a, an irish grind of some sort on it um, so if you're blind and and you want to be a turner there's only a couple things that you have to do differently than anybody else does and that is figure out how when you launch onto your piece you know how do you not clip it how do you not throw your tool across the shop or whatever and, and the same thing is true with I don't care if you're sighted or blind anybody I teach to start first thing I teach them is land your tool on the on the tool rest pull the handle back until you start feeling it you know mm -hmm. Feel it, then you'll feel it ride the bevel, and then you bring it up, and then you 
very slowly just move your hand across. And that's a great explanation of that. And, and, and most people, don't, most people, when they want to turn in that is that, you know, people think you should be moving your arms all around. I tell people, this big handle here especially, it's, it's, it's put it against your hip, okay, then move from, move from your ankles, move, this is a dance, this isn't, this isn't flailing around, you know, this is, this is a dance that you want to do with the piece of wood, mm -hmm. and you want to be relaxed, and you want, here a lot of people talk about, you know, they, um, hands get sore when they turn, if your hands are getting sore when you're turning, you're turning, you're holding on to your tools way too tight, and the other thing I, this, this one does, this one has a relatively small handle. I'm not a really big fan of real small handles, except I really like this big long handle that's on this one. But if you're having trouble with your hands too, go to a bigger, t you're a turner. Turn yourself bigger handles, bigger <laughs> diameter. So you, you know, yeah. if your fingers are arthritic, you know, you start, you start being able to um, hold on to the tool without having to squeeze your fingers together too much. So this, um, it's a little Rikon lathe, and uh, there are a lot of lathes in this size category. And I particularly like these because they weigh considerably more than the, uh, most of the lathes in their category. So, so I come up here, and just got the back of the tool against this. My, my wood runs from here to here. I know about where it is, so down here at the end, lift my hand up. I use the back of my finger against the tool rest as a guide. And it's, if you listen, you hear that real nice smooth, because we're still a little bit square. But here's how the pitch changed right there. Mm -hmm. And we're probably very close stop it here and see we're very close to round. We have, we are totally round at this end down here, got a few little flat spots down here at this end. Um, you can, by your finger against the, the back of this finger here, almost all tool rests have a little, a little trough right there. You can learn to clamp your, your tool between your thumb and first finger and, and run across and, and you can learn to give yourself, if, if your tool rest is straight, which we're a little bit crooked, so that's how we ended up with a little bit of, of a, a little, tape. little taper on this one. And um, but it, if you, it doesn't take. Um, what do I want to say? Between okay, right there is where we're to round. So a tiny bit of flat round. You're really listening. Just listen, and you can really feel in the tool, too. You can feel the, how the tool bounces. There's no bounce over there unless you get the tool crooked. But here again, it's, it's from your ankles. It's not from your, not from your arms. Okay, you want a little, I'm going to dig a little bit out here and make a little shape on it. Now, I've done all of that without ever even touching the piece, just basically feeling how the tool moves against the tool rest and know that I already made a little, a little spot, little here, a little yeah. cove here. And, um, and then once I get to, you know, to that point with this you know, big tool, which is, doesn't give you a huge amount of... Um, it gives you really good feedback in a, in a small, you know small area, um, let's see here, okay, and then you can even, that was a, here is somebody's um, carbide tip tool that has a square shaft on it, so if you are a person who doesn't think that they can keep the angle right on a round shafted piece, now this piece has, here again has a nice long handle on it. I have it underneath my forearm. So I actually have my finger right up here, right where the tool is. And now I'm making this a perfect little cove. Mm 
Use your finger as the fulcrum point. And the shape of the tool. And the shape of the tool. Yep. Had a little round end on the shape of, on the end of there. Here again, dressed up that cove real good. Got all the 90% of the marks out from the, from the bigger tool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want finer detail yet, you know, go to a, you can go to a, um, a little bit, go to a little tiny scraper. Now, because of the tool thickness has changed dramatically and the amount of wood has gone away, We'll bring our tool rest up to accommodate the thinner tool. Bring our tool in, because we didn't really want to turn this into a chatter tool. We have a little tiny round nose scraper here. And it's interesting because lots of times a person who's cutting visually watches the line that their tool makes as it goes across. Mm -hmm. That same line is also appears on the back side of this piece. I can follow with my finger on the back side across at the same time that that tool's making the cut, that you watch that line visually. You watch it up on top, you watch that line move through there. So you're watching with touch. I'm, I'm just watching with my one finger across yeah. the back. And, um, and I always tell people that that's the much safer place to, to watch from if you're working with a lathe, because what you don't want is you don't want your finger ever to end up down in here between the, the sure. tool rest and the tool. And I always, when I, when I teach with people all the time, um, this has a belt drive on it over here, which I really, really like. You can leave the, you can leave the belt tightener knob loose so mm -hmm. that if they ever get their finger in there, the, the belt will slip rather than chewing it. Because if you have that tightened right up, it'll just keep digging away at your finger until you really yes. scream uncle. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Tell you what, George, this has really been great. I've started thinking about woodworking in a completely different way. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot, whether you're sighted or unsighted, that you can teach. Yeah. And I try to tell people all the time that, you know, how I envision something in my mind is exactly the way that you envision it in your mind. You take a concept, you look at a piece of wood, you know, you say, what can I make out of that piece of wood? I, I look at that same piece of wood and I say the same things and I, I draw the picture in my head and everybody draws the picture in your head first because that's the only spot it can read. You do not draw with your eyeballs. You draw with your hands and your brain. Your eyeballs are just a directional agent to help get you there. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can obtain those very same things tactily for the most part that you can visually. Well, this has been a great experience. Thank you so much, George. Yeah, thank you. Come back again and spend some time. I want to come down and uh, I want to come down and build a chair. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs>
gives great cuts on your table saw every time. Now, I have a chop master for my miter saw, Forrest. The cuts will make you smile every time. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today, but Check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on The Highland Woodworker.